calling on us to rise up and come together, even in our, on our Zoom accounts um, from the different locations where we probably sit more than we ever have before. And we are extremely happy to see so much interest in our program among Japanese Americans. And we are thrilled to have all of you here. So that said, before we get into our content, I want to one, ask you again to please use the chat to introduce yourselves, um, your name, your location, and if you have one, an organizational affiliation. Um, we are going to use the chat throughout the day. It's what we, we think of this as a democratizing space. And since we can't all get up and meet and greet each other, this is one way that we can interact. If your computer or phone is on, um, if the mic is on, could you please mute your mic? Thank you. And I will go over some um, Zoom tips for us. And before we, before we get into the content of our program, we want to do this um, so that we can all ease into this time together. So if you have questions about Zoom, the first thing I want to point out is that you can send your questions um, to the San Jose Nikkei Resistor moderator. And um, Alexis Croft has her name um, as the SJNR moderator. So you can go ahead and chat for questions if you have them. Um, <clears throat> So I want to point out a couple things. Um, we have a mute button over here in the bottom left-hand corner and a stop video um, or start video icon as well. And you can turn these off and on, they toggle off and on. And so if you can keep, please keep your mute, uh, your mic muted through our program, unless you are speaking, we would really appreciate it. Um, and if you could please um, keep your video on as much as you're comfortable with. We really would like you to do that in our breakout sessions um, so that we can actually have a chance to interact with each other. I've been talking about the chat, and so I wanna point out the icon for the chat right here. If you wanna use the chat, you can um, click this button and it will open up this chat box for you, this window for you. Um, if you want to chat to, not to everybody, but for example, to, to the San Jose Nikkei Resistor moderator, you can click right here where it says everyone, um, and a list of participants will show up and you can search for the SJNR moderator to chat her. Um, this reactions button is to show appreciation. You can give a thumbs up or you can do a hand clap. Um, and then finally, the speaker view. We are planning on spotlighting our speakers, but if for some reason the spotlight isn't happening, um, please use the speaker view so that only the speaker will show up. Um, in on your screen. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So here is what we are hoping to do today in our short time with you. Um, we wish to provide a safe and brave space um, that also empowers our Japanese American and AAPI community members in particular to process the current events that are going on. We also hope to learn from and listen to Reverend Moore of the Silicon Valley San Jose NAACP on the experiences of the Black community members and how the JAAAPI community can be strong partners and allies in solidarity to end white supremacy. And finally, <clears throat> we invite our Japanese American and Asian American Pacific Islander community members to learn about the San Jose Nikkei Resistors, meet members of other Japanese American, Asian American Pacific Islander civil, civil liberties organizations and explore the ways that we can all get involved in working for justice. So those are our overarching goals. And I want to go over our program with you. Um, I know that Alexis, our moderator, has chatted out the participant program agenda to you. Um, on there, you will find kind of a way to follow our program. There are some links on there. We have in there um, to be transparent about how we want to interact in the virtual space. We also have some, the questions that we hope you chat out at, at given times um, in our program. Um, <clears throat> And we also have our actual program. So here's what we'll be doing today. Um, 
We have already started the welcoming introductions. We are going to be presenting our statement on Black Lives Matter. Um, Richard Konda of the Asian, uh, the executive director of the Asian Law Alliance will be introducing Reverend Jethro Moore, um, who will be speaking to us today. He's our keynote speaker. Um, <clears throat> we'll be moving into talking about some actions around HR 40, which is the um, commission bill to, um, uh, to study reparations for slavery. We'll be talking about that more. We'll be moving into breakout discussions after that, where we hope that you will be able to start um, um, start to engage or continue to engage in some of the, the discussion and topics that have arisen during our, our forum here. Um, and then we will reconvene for a whole group share out and the next steps. Okay, I'll now hand over the mic to um, Susan Hayase, who is a co-founder of the San Jose Nuclear Resistance. Uh, thank you very much, Erica. Um, I wanted to um, just introduce uh, a little bit of uh, who we are and what we're doing. Uh, one of San Jose Nikkei Resistors' goals is to unite, organize, and mobilize the local San Jose Nikkei community to fight for justice and to defend civil liberties. Um, we work with the co-sponsoring organizations to give a voice to the San Jose Japanese American community and to encourage action in opposition to the attacks on immigrants and other injustices. And we've noticed in recent years um, an uptick in new people in our community like you stepping forward to get involved and we're not surprised and we welcome uh, all of your contributions and growing leadership. Um, many of you here have been active in social justice activism for decades and I know many of you from the work we did in the movement for redress and reparations for the World War II mass exclusion and incarceration, um, both in San Jose and other cities where NCRR chapters work. And I wanna thank you for coming today and I respect your enduring commitment. So San Jose uh, Nikkei Resistors, uh, we're just a local group doing local organizing, but you know, shelter in place accidentally let us reach more of you. So we're very happy to see you and we welcome everyone to virtual San Jose. Um, back to you, Erica. Oops. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit of context about this particular forum today. Um, so we, our forum, as you know, is called Nikkei for Black Lives. And our hope is that we are working to end white supremacy. So originally this forum was going to focus on how our community could combat the rise of anti-Asian attacks and scapegoating during the pandemic. But the current situation that began with the murder of George Floyd, followed by national protests, including here in San Jose, which have continued for several weeks, this is a historic moment. And we, with the support of these sponsoring organizations that you see in front of you, <clears throat> decided that we should switch focus. We see this current moment of public contest, resistance, and popular mobilization against anti-Blackness and white supremacy as an urgent movement, an urgent movement to which we all belong. So while our attention for this forum shifted to create an intentional space to build solidarity around work for Black lives, we see this as part of a broader movement toward the dismantling of white supremacy, which has everything to do with anti-Asian racism and violence. So this is to say that this moment requires that we come together in solidarity and with strategy to find our way to justice. On a personal note, I just wanna say that I am deeply moved by what I am witnessing. I know that all the people who are in the streets protesting, in homes, talking to family and friends, at work, coming together through difficult dialogue. All of you who are taking time on a Sunday afternoon to look at a screen, again, are doing so from a place of love and deep commitment to humanity. It is time for us. <clears throat> As a Yonsei granddaughter of Japanese American incarcerees and the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, 
I know that we, we the people together, are, the, are our only hope in combating threats to our freedom. So it is, that, it is that our acts of resistance must be done, so it is that our acts of resistance must be done in solidarity with one another. <clears throat> this stance of solidarity is the principle through which the San Jose Nikkei resistors, a grassroots Japanese American organization operates and why I, it is that we felt it necessary to put out a statement on Black Lives Matter. Alice Hikido will read this to us now. So Alice Hikido <clears throat> is a member of the San Jose Nikkei Resistors. She joined us, she joined the San Jose Nikkei <clears throat> Resistors because in her words, I felt it was especially important for those of us who experienced the internment to not stay silent when we see injustice in our society. We have that lesson to share. So Alice will read the San Jose Nikkei Resistors statement on Black Lives Matter, which we published in writing on June 4th. There we are. Please start, Alice. All right. San Jose Nikkei Resistors unequivocally supports the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests against police brutality that have risen up across the country we echo the call for justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amon Aubrey, Tony McDade, Nina Paul, and every Black person who has been killed by the police, recorded or not. We remember Eric Gardner, a Black man killed by NYPD in 2014. We remember Melvin Truth a 17-year-old Black high school student murdered by San Jose police in 1985. And we remember Philip Watkins, a 23-year-old Black man killed by San Jose police in 2015. All Black people deserve to live free of police terror. Modern policing in the U.S. evolved from the organized patrol of enslaved Black people. Today, we rise up in protest against the continued abuse of power by police against the Black community. Unsurprisingly, police forces across the country have responded to the protests with violence. Here in San Jose, police answered peaceful protests with tear gas, rubber bullets, flashbangs, and batons. SJPD has a history of brutality against Black and other people of color. We remember Antonio Guzman Lopez, Anthony Nunes, Jacob Dominguez, Jennifer Vasquez, and other local Black and Brown people killed by the police. San Jose Resistors specifically condemns Tho Tao of Minneapolis PD, whose complicity killed George Floyd and Jared Ewan of San Jose Police Department who incited violence against protesters on May 29th. Anti-Blackness is deadly. We call on Asian Americans to support Black Americans in the struggle against white supremacy, a struggle that we share. We call on Japanese Americans and others to join our organization's efforts to support HR 40 as the first step towards Black reparations. The San Jose Nikkei Resistors stand in solidarity with the Black community. And now I'd like to turn this over to Richard Konda, the Executive Director of the Asian Law Alliance, who will introduce our main speaker. Thank you so much, Alice. I have marched in rallies with Reverend Jeff Moore, stood shoulder to shoulder with him at protests and press conferences, been on panel discussions with him, this is my first opportunity to introduce him. Reverend Jeff Moore is the current president of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP. He is a tireless advocate in our community, defending the civil rights of all, defending immigrant rights, defending the rights of those who are unhoused, defending the voting rights of people of color. Reverend Jeff Moore worked with many in the community to stop tasers from being used in our jails and used by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. He led the fight against the plan to have pepper spray used against our youth in juvenile hall. Reverend Moore joined with the Asian Law Alliance to protect the voting rights 
of Asian Americans in the city of Santa Clara and helped us defeat Measure A in 2018 and Measure C in 2020. Jeff is a founding member of the Black Kitchen Cabinet, and the Black Kitchen Cabinet recently issued a strong statement against Asian anti-Asian racism, and we thank you that, for that very much, Jeff. These are only a few examples of Reverend Moore's dedication to the principles of equality and justice for all. We are fortunate to, that Reverend Moore will be our featured speaker today. Reverend Moore. I just want to uh, thank you, uh, Richard, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Some of that stuff I don't even keep records of. I didn't remember, but you brought to remember. Thank you, brother, and, and I love you for that. And uh, have the utmost respect. And, and for I believe it was Erica who uh, who started off today. We um, I feel you. Begin to wipe my eyes with you, because what you said is so true. And until we all start having that feeling of threat and hurt and harm happening to us. It's the only way we're going to change this current situation. It's one of the ways. And I thank you guys for supporting and trying to bring to forefront HR 40 because um, African American Black people have been here since the start of this nation. We're not credited for the work we did in the, Civil, in the uh, Revolutionary War. We're not credited for the work in any of the wars of America that helped set America free or the long slavery and never getting made whole in this country. And until today, those same police departments still practicing some of those same slaveholder tactics. As we know that when the Confederacy lost, um, many of the Confederate soldiers went to become sheriffs and police of local municipalities. So it continues. But I wanted to tell everyone, um, a child, it is not embraced by the village, will burn it down till it fills the warmth, is an African proverb. And what we see today is so, I'm so proud of these young people. And yesterday I told them, you've done more in, <laughs> in a month and a half than I've done in 10 years. We see Confederate emblems coming down and statues coming down and people talking about making a change and a community of people coming out to support Black people, African Americans. The recent killings of George and Brianna and Tony and Sean and, and Aubrey uh, and others prompted hundreds and thousands of people to take action together. Generations of injustice are coming to bear on, on the streets today. It, they are our streets. Out of this pain, we're also seeing a new and unsettling force rising up to disrupt the system that is killing our people, smothering our communities and disregarding our basic needs during a global pandemic. Our recent national survey said uh, uh, that 75% of people feel that we got 46 minus one or, or Agent Orange is the single greatest threat to the African-American black community or to the democracy of this America that we have. This feeling was only amplified when he sat there and said that when they start looting, we start shooting. What is happening to America? Our communities are angry and sad, but we must be strategic and measured as we battle this latest grave injustice. NWSP will not rest until we see these officers charged and convicted of murder of George Floyd. We must keep up our focus on redressing the systemic racism against our community that led to this tragedy. We cannot afford to do so while losing more black and daughters, sons and daughters. We must protest peacefully, demand persistently, and fight politically. Most of all, we must vote in November to ensure our survival as a free black people of this country. Two things need to happen. First, what has now become clear to the world is the ongoing practice of police brutality, specifically against the black community. It's not only a civil rights issue, but also a human rights issue. The NAACP on the national level is calling on the United Nations to step up and classify mistreatment of black people in the United States by the police as a human rights violation. 
aggressively call out the US government in the process and impose sanctions if necessary. Secondly, we need sweeping police reform, federal legislation mandate, mandating a zero tolerance approach and penalizing and or prosecuting police officers who killed unarmed, nonviolent, non-resistant individuals in an arrest. This federal legislation must include the following principles. A ban on the use of knee holes and choke holes as an acceptable practice for any police officer. The use of force continuum for any police department in this country must ensure that there are at least six levels of steps with clear rules of escalation on escalation. Each state opens records act must ensure officer misconduct information and disciplinary histories are not shielded from the public. Recertification credentials may be denied for police officers if they're determined that their use of deadly force was unwarranted by federal guidelines. Implementation of a citizens review board in municipalities to hold police departments accountable and build confidence for the community. Now, as part of the San Jose part, and you know, my, mine is a little bit more <laughs> stringent, I think, or hopefully we can help you guys help us get there. And, and we are calling for Santa Clara County to develop and implement an efficient and effective process to decertify law officers that violate the law or fail to meet public standards for law enforcement professionals. For Santa Clara County to report decertified officers to the National Decertification Index to ensure the effects of decertification across state lines, meaning when an officer loses part of his, his credentials as a police, he can no longer practice policing here in San Jose, but in, he cannot take a lateral someplace else and go get a job and be somebody else's problem. Um, the firing, as you mentioned, of, of San Jose police officer, Jared, for not de-escalation, but only escalating the problem. Demilitarizing the police, and, and I think I send you this one, Richard. Uh, we're just working on this one, and I'm getting the paperwork back, and I want you to hear me. A 1% of San Jose Police Department's annual share of the general fund, we can send 1,200 students to the city's three universities and colleges, 400 students to San Jose State University, 400 students to Evergreen Valley College, and 400 students to San Jose City College for free every year, just using 1% of this police budget as it currently said from the general fund. Even That would even assume administrative costs, stipends in excess of tuition fees and regular tuition increases. This fund as proposed will remain sustainable. 1.5 million over budgeted, over budget by 2029 through 30, Next, we want to support the ethics rules change request to reduce conflicts of interest for prosecutors. This was brought forth by George Gascon, former San Francisco District Attorney, that prosecutors are in a unique position, having to work closely with law enforcement officers and, and, and evaluate whether some of these officers. So what we want to do is take away the ability for police unions to donate or to sponsor or to support a prosecutor in office. That way, it frees the prosecutor up and to be free to press charges against an officer if he behaves or acts unbecomingly. And he's not subject to worrying about the funding or support from that union. Next, all Santa Clara County law enforcement agency must have citizens review board. The paper I will have out on that, uh, hopefully I'll have it by Tuesday as they have, I, I told people earlier, I'm not the best writer. So they take mine and they're gonna redo that one all together. I have a retired uh, police officer I'm working with named Richard so that they can meet their standards and training so that they can't call it the question uh, that I not, do not have that practical experience. Um, next, the Santa Clara County police officers Departments must be transparent and honest about incidents of use of force and produce weekly reports to the County Board of Supervisors so we can know what happens. Uh, Los Gatos, let's say as an example, is quiet all the time, but something's happening up there. You know, there's, there's not, it's something. We just want to know what's going on, right? Uh, and Santa Clara County also must end 
any participation in the 1033 program, federal program, uh, and in all programs that provide military training for local and state police. The 1033 program is where they get the use of military hardware, military equipment, uh, and firearms to bring into our, in our community. So if we can end Santa Clara's participation in that, that'd be great. And lastly, I, um, I, and that's it, and I just really wanted to open up for questions. I, I am so moved. Uh, I wanted to get those things out there to begin a discussion about, and I know that's a lot. So these are the efforts that as we take back control or we reset, we can never go back to normal. Never again must I experience what I experienced when trying to stand there and asking kids to kneel in peace and have police officers come to us and want to push us and knock us down or, or randomly spraying the crowd with uh, uh, rubber bullets or shooting tear gas into their own communities. We are their people. They are supposed to be our officers and not an occupying force in our community. We are not a totalitarian society. And so we, as together, to, to work together to help change this, must come together to reclaim our city and our county and our nation. If not, if we aren't successful in voting that person out of office in November, God help us all. God help us is, is all I can say, because um, if these first three and a half years are like this, what will six years look like? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is Susan. Uh, thank you, Reverend Moore. Um, that was very comprehensive uh, coverage of all the reforms that need to happen in San, San Jose and Santa Clara County, and really appreciate this. I think it gives us a, a good understanding or a beginning to understand of this complex strategy um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, do you have an opinion about the San Jose Independent Police uh, Auditor, and do you have suggestions for uh, improving that situation? Um, I like Siobhan, I, I like her staff. They have been, they were better for our community than they are now, not of no fault of their own. I believe they were compromised by their own city government and their own city leaders with the way they handled the whole Aaron, I believe was at Switzer, was the last police auditor that we had. Um, is there some use for them? Uh, I, mean, I never want to cost a person that's doing a good job their job, so that we'd have to find a way. But from the outside, if there's something that would have to be totally uh, uh, independent that would sit over those entities that would have investigative powers, powers. and they most of the time they say they don't want civilian oversight. Uh, but I say we have Santa Clara County uh, federal grand jury. We have grand juries that have oversight and look in thing and subpoena and look in. And those are civilians doing that job. Why can't civilians do it over police departments? And so, yes, there's a place for Siobhan and, 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 and the auditors, but what does that look like? And how do we redesign that type of thing? And um, because currently I would question how many people even go anymore. You know, they, they, they really hurt the trust and the faith I feel that they had in, in some of the processes that they that they uh, practiced there. So Thank I would you. say reshape it in some form, you know. I see. Uh, let's see. Let me see if there's some um, questions here in the chat. Um, here's a question um, from Will Kaku. What do you think about community policing? Is it effective to hire more officers of color and those who live in disadvantaged communities? Hmm. Oh, that's a beautiful question. And, and once again, statistics, as you look, and, and I studied and I believe, uh, I can't remember the organization, they have a fact sheet that they have found that, um, and I can get that information for you. They have found that having police of color actually some, tends to lower uh, miss, uh, the police encounters of, 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 people, of color, uh, people of color. Um, I think that when San Jose had more black police officers and command staff, uh, no longer than we've seen this outbreak here, I think, um, um, if we had more people of color, I think it would have lowered uh, the incidents because we have more people we can relate to and more people, I, I would say not just so much people of color, but people who live here in our community. 
because if you live here amongst us, I think you'd be less likely to do any hurt or harm to us. Thank you. Um, there's also a question um, uh, from Jeremy. Uh, would you, uh, I would also like to hear more about the defunding movement. I think this has uh, been getting a lot of uh, national attention and also in San Jose. So would you like to comment about that? Yeah, defunding was, as I said, 1% of the, the police budget that we take from the general fund. That's, that's one of the processes to uh, uh, defund them and their, and their money. Uh, um, and put it toward actual, like I was talking with the Mill Peters police, they uh, yesterday bought, uh, a couple of weeks ago, whenever they bought this big old tank that sits in the yard or whatever and they don't use it. I said, how many students could we have used that military hardware money to actually pay for summer jobs in the summertime to give kids employment or to give kids uh, or, or other opportunities that we could have used it by creating other summer jobs for people. You know, that, that it's about using the funding instead of building it up. I say, how many people own guns and you have a gun sitting in a drawer someplace, you never use it, right? So it's, it, it's a $200, $300 investment that you never use. We are investing in equipment that they only train and so they didn't feel they need to use it. So again, I would say defund and militarize. We want to demilitarize the police and bring them back to a community concept. There is no need for them to have that much military hardware to use on the community. It's not for parades. It's not for football games. I mean, we're, we're, we're not, we're, they're not like they're in an occupying force. And again, they're not. So use the money that's going towards that militarization of police to take away. Let's put it in response vehicles for mental health. When someone calls and said, I'm having a mental health breakdown, I'm having a mental health crisis, they can actually send a group of people or, 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 or a car out that specializes in that situation for, for mental health breakdowns and not send armed police and it's not a knock against the police, but the police aren't trained completely to how to handle mental health issues. And that's where the problem comes in. We're sending the wrong people to put it out. And I'll just end with saying, why do people love the fire department but hate, hate the police department? Fire department comes in, helps and save when they look as its heroes. Whereas police come in, you know, and it's a simple domestic violence and the husband ends up getting beat down because of a domestic violence issue. So there needs to be specialized people that know how to handle these and know how to talk these and work these down with the families and not bring harm and criminalize uh, um, mental health issues. America has a mental health issue. My community has a mental health issue. Most communities have some form from the years of oppression and maltreatment by the systems and by uh, white extremists or, 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 you know, so I'll just leave it there. But yes, we can move the money. 1%, 2% of the budget, take it from the police and let's do something with the schools. We wouldn't have schools falling apart. We could build up our schools. We could, there's so many other ways you can look at it. And I don't want to get nailed into one, but the schools that don't have Wi-Fi or communities that don't have Wi-Fi, it's unexcusable. We have the money, but we want to put it in military hardware. Let's fix up the, even if we want to say the roads, you know, there's so much way that it could do so much better for us. I'm sorry. That's what I'm doing. Right. It's, uh, there are all these things that need to be funded that people complain about, but, but never consider uh, all the money that goes to the police. Um, I have a question here from Franco. Um, what are effective ways you're seeing non-Black communities of color be allies to Black Lives Matter movement? Well, this right here. <laughs> this, I've been in a lot of meetings. This, this is what we're supposed to be. Your organization stands for what my organization stands for. And organizations, we're supposed to line up and look at the system and, and excuse me, y'all, but say, hell no, that ain't going. I don't, I don't care what ethnicity they are. You're not going to mistreat our people, my community, my neighbors, you know, the people I drive with, you know, the, the kids, my kids play basketball. It's a multiracial team. And when we go out, we're all together. What happened to us as children? When I looked at my kids as young kids and they just all went into a little yard and they all played together. That's something that we saw, but we need to get back to that playground mentality where we're all in this. And when somebody comes in there disrupting or not treating someone fairly, we all rise up. We all rise up and say, not here. And that's how America, the next part of this reset or this new democracy has to be, that we're going to say no to injustice. And, and I, I hope, I want to say that NASCAR has said that in some form, 
if you've ever been to um, um, Alabama, you know, my family lives in Atlanta, and if I drive to Alabama, you have to go through Talladega. And if you, I say, if you go through there during the wrong time, they pop up all these Confederate flags everywhere. You're almost petrified to go to a gas station, right? No more NASCAR said. Now we have to bag NASCAR and, and hope that they're sincere and look at what they're going to do when uh, someone breaks those rules, right? And we have to hold them accountable, all of us do. I'll get going if you don't stop me. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, thank you. And um, we have some more question about um, accountability. Um, uh, you you mentioned uh, some things about the decertification, um, mm -hmm. also about the police unions. Do you have any other thoughts about the police unions and accountability? And uh, you know, uh, well, well, one thing that's always you know. Um, 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 I'm on post California peace officer standards and uh, this Thursday at, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, um, we're now on Zoom meetings and they're going to Zoom meet it to the public. And I'd encourage the public to, to, to come in on the Zoom meeting and watch how we, uh, uh, as part of post, uh, try to work with the training manual and turn, turning the uh, ship. Uh, Manning, I believe, is trying to turn the ship. I believe a uh, uh, prosecutor from Long, um, the Santa Barbara, Joyce Dudley, she's trying to turn the ship. And it's a delicate ship because police officers sometimes, especially you, they seem to be oversensitive as professionals. Um, so uh, this coming Thursday at 9.30 and someplace along the agenda, I don't remember which agenda item it is, we're going to take on chokeholds. Uh, and so hopefully we're going to be removing chokeholds out of any training module. And there's two modules in particular. We're going to be removing it for certification out of police standards and training. So therefore, uh, any police that practice it is not certified by the state of California and did not get their training here. Uh, my understanding is individual departments might still be able to get it, but then we know that department did it on its own. So nationally, so when we talk about decertification, one thing is it's bad when uh, we look at the Minnesota officer and he had 18 demerits, 18 whatever. If we as a community oversight had saw this and were subjective or objective to it, we could have said this officer could no longer practice it in our department. But too often we find that police, uh, they've, they've trained together, they went to these classes together. So when it comes time to judge them, they're a little bit more lenient mm -hmm. by saying, we don't understand because we're not out there in the field. But wrong is still wrong, right? As we saw the two cops sit, stand there, as the guy had his knee on the throat of Floyd for eight minutes and 46, seven. I think one of them now is saying, he was. He wanted to say something, but he did not have the seniority to say something. We must. We must empower those, even no matter what rank you are, to be able to speak up. And they know that the safety net that protects them is us, the community, and not the police union. And see, that's where the police union levies its position as I'm your protector. And oftentimes, for me as a black community, for you as the Japanese community, and others out there in their if they're a minority community. Those same union laws don't protect people of color that are in these positions. You'll see black officers and Japanese officers get fired for less than what the other officers, but they'll tell us everything's equal and fine here. Mm -hmm. And what I have found and believe that thin blue line is not a thin blue line, it is a thick blue line. It is a bloodline that they won't break and they won't cross. And, and, and if you testify against them, uh, I, I believe my understanding of uh, was the cop that did that rampage, terrible thing. But now I'm looking at, anyway, I get all over the place, but uh, the shooting in, in, in um, Oakland and uh, Aptos had a uh, cop uh, that did these shootings possibly, right? And, um, 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 and, and there's some mental health issues that we're not dealing with that are, that are in police departments. And so one is maybe even do more things uh, um, to help get mental health service to them from dealing with tragedies. And so that's, I try to give a caveat, I try to always look at what we can do to help make their job better. And, and maybe they need some more intensive mental health help when they leave. But you know, I mean, when they're as working, when they've been there five years, they have to do some type of review and some type of mental health relaxation or something for when they come to, my community, you know, um, when I lived in East San Jose, the way they pull you over, curse you out, want to get you out the car. Who are you talking to? I'm a citizen. I'm not a thug. I'm not a gangster. I'm just a black man. Why are you talking that way? I want to be treated the same way that the, the people in Almaden Valley are treated, you know? That's what I guess I'm saying. Yeah. Right. 
Um, there's another question. Um, I think that a lot of the issues that you're uh, raising are very practical uh, and go across many different uh, areas um, of governance in the counties and the cities. And so um, a question from, uh, uh, Ju wait, where is that question? The question rolled down. Oh, um, the recommendations, the recommendations that you've been talking about for policy changes, um, are they written down somewhere? And can we, how can we find out what your proposals are so that we can take action and help support them? Well, one is the one I'm working on with Professor William Armerline and uh, Roger D. Bug and, and Richard. I don't think he's checked his email because we always, Richard's right there is one of our brothers. So, you know, we, we pull Richard in and Sacred Heart, uh, we, we pulled it in because it affects the homeless and the housing community. All this affects us. And I think I sent you a copy in your email. I was telling Richard earlier of, of what the plan looks like to take away the 1% and what the scholarships look like and where we can pull the money. That plan is already in documented and working. Uh, the other one, the oversight community with policing, I hope to have the finished document. The goal was, uh, the, the goal I had worked with Richard uh, was to have something that I could present it post on Thursday uh, of what we're talking about. And so I hope to have that by Tuesday. And so we will pu put these documents together in a um, some type of uh, community platform so we can open it up and you can see everything step by step and that we're trying to make sure that we're not breaking any laws, but we're helping re establishing new guidelines and new substance for police departments and for communities to look like, look at on not just uh, our city level, because I, I get so frustrated with San Jose and Silica, or Santa Clara County sometimes because we're supposed to be the land of innovation and the land, the land of thinking outside the box. But when it comes to reforming our police department, we stay right here stuck in the 19th century. And, and I think that is just, do the, the poor leadership, you know, you know, look outside, we got everything right here. We should be trying to use things that are different. And I don't mean surveillance equipment either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Say no to face, facial recognition, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I think we're, we're starting to get to the end, but what I wanted to ask you um, is, well, I, also to, in, in answer to some of the people's uh, interest in uh, getting behind a lot of the, the proposals that you have, um, I'm, I'm guessing that if they get on your NAACP mailing list, that will mm -hmm. keep them informed. And then I think mm -hmm. San Jose Nike Resistors and some of the other co-sponsors, we could also try to keep people informed of mm -hmm. things that we hear. And I guess the last question I'd like to ask you is, um, what gives you hope at this time? You. <laughs> And um, what you guys are doing here, and I see one of the questions, and I understand that 1% doesn't demilitarize the police, but we're talking about starting points and entry entry levels to take down the whole system. Oh, that sounds terrible, but take down the whole demilitarized part of the police. But groups like you and, and conversations like this and, and coming shoulder to shoulder, just to hear that you guys are willing to um, support us. And HR 40 is, is huge because we have said here is, um, we didn't come here because we want to ancestrally, you know, yeah. and we've helped build this country, you know, on our on, on backs of on my ancestors. And sometimes when I'm looking and I watch history and I look back in history, I see things that are, or inventors that say they invented stuff. And I said, but you guys didn't do the work. What made you figure that out? I said, there was somebody out there that was doing the work for free that didn't have the rights to claim a patent, didn't have the rights to even own the land. And now you, 30 years later, your family has that patent that some slave in, out in the field designed for your father. And you get all the credit and you never think about the years. And when people say, well, black people, you've been here so long, you should have came up. If you just look at the history of all the laws, all the trickery, the 2008 redlining and the, and the fake loans, and we never arrested a banker, just we are trying and, and one of the handicaps that we have had and, and i've often admired uh, is even what to say the japanese community and you're able to hold on to your culture because you know where you came from all i could do this past year was to go back on the year of the return to go back to ghana and go back on the shores of which my ancestors came from and walk through the the, the, the last bath to try to understand what happened to my people and hear stories that there were those that resisted there were those that fought back, but not to know what my native language is. 
not to know what my real name is. And that's sometimes what um, hurts with, um, I've been on the Santa Clara County Health person about releasing the names of the people because it's a death record, it's a public record. But these people who have died of COVID-19, you won't put their names so that we can know them as people, not a number. When my ancestors were brought out of Africa, they were put on a slave boat and a certain percentage was allowed to die as a business expense before they got here and they never record hoarded their names or where they were from. And so when me as the black man, you're traumatizing us again when I look at it and Santa Clara County will only put them down as a percentage. It's all over again. So it becomes an acceptable loss of a community of people and it's not acceptable. They need to be recognized. The people who have lost life due to police violence, I've told the mayor this before, they need to be recognized because they are hurting. I'm not trying to judge if they were right or wrong in what happened to them, but the fact that we need to understand the police killed somebody and we need to stop this, that's not right. And how do we remind our community that we don't want to kill them by police violence, but by putting up some type of memorial, some type of way of remembering them. Why is that so hard? And last, I want to tell everybody, I have put to the Santa Clara County board and I put to the city. Before the increase in Asian hate crimes came up a year back in July, last year, July 31st, I sent a request that we form a hate task force that was formed and led by community members. They have since in the sort taken that and distorted that and used it for a political form to put political inserts instead of us, the people. And they will keep wanting to treat us as though us, the people, can't take care of us together. They keep wanting to separate us and divide us, and that's what we can't allow to happen. Never again will people be interned. We cannot allow Latinos to be put in cages and families separated. There is no place in the right mind for anybody that considers himself a legal, a leader in this community, in this America, for that to happen again. No community is great without the other parts of the community. And we all are pillars of this. I'm so sorry, but this hurts and it angers me that people say they're leaders and so many of them are just jogging for other political positions. I guess they get a retirement that I don't set. Let's see. And so people say, Jeff, you should run for office. I could never run for office because I'm not going to be part of the board or blending into the assimilated into the machine. I want to be outside banging on the machine and hope the chips fall out for free. <laughs> I don't know, but you, you guys know what I mean, right? I don't want to be part of the machine because the machine ain't giving righteousness to the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reverend Moore, I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I, I think that we want to be on the outside with you helping you bang on the machine. I mean, I think I, I think I speak for everybody here that um, your talk has been so not only informative, but I feel so moved and by the unity and the care that you show for all the people and the, that civil rights are human rights. And um, I think when you talk about not being recognized. I think a lot of people of color have that feeling too. And I think that you speak for many of us when you when you talk about um, you know how the system is just inhumane and just uh, so I anyway, thank you very much. And I I know that you know um, many people in the Japanese American community uh, we we want to do something and we've always wanted to do something many of us um, in our organization the san jose nikkei resistors uh, we felt that something concrete that we could do was to organize japanese americans in support of hr 40 which for people who aren't familiar it's called the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for african americans act so last year we started organizing community discussions on this bill and also to reflect about our own redress struggle. And the result of this was that our co-sponsoring organizations um, for this forum, we signed onto a joint resolution last year supporting this legislation, which proposes to create a commission which is similar to the commission that investigated our reparations claim in the 1980s. 
and we hope other organizations will uh, do the same. We and we're continuing to do that. Um, so I wanted to just say uh, that HR 40 is not just um, a regular bill for civic reform or things that we might want to support. I wanted to tell people that, you know, I think we understand that, you know, the struggle of African Americans for equality since the beginning of this nation has been one of the greatest inspirations for all of us and that black people have fought without giving up to make the Constitution and the Bill of Rights actually mean something, even if the system of white supremacy left them out. And I think that I want to remind everybody here that a good example of this is that black Americans were the earliest and staunchest supporters of Japanese American redress efforts. So many of us, especially those of us in the NCRR, National Coalition for Redress Reparations, felt strongly that our fight for redress was one for equality and against exclusion. And not all Japanese American organizations felt this way, but the NCRR pledged to support the efforts of others, such as Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Black people, Chicanos, and others struggling for reparations and justice. So if we remember that our fight for redress and reparations for the World War II forced removal and incarceration was a fight for equality and, and justice and against second-class citizenship, then we must do something today to join the fight against white supremacy because our redress victory, while significant politically and personally meaningful for us, did not establish justice and equality for everybody. So that fight is still brewing and we owe it to ourselves, to our generations yet to be born, and to all the people of this country to find out what's going on and to get involved. And in San Jose, we have a particular situation as Reverend Moore has explained, and it is both similar to things happening elsewhere in the country, but it's also particular to our local area, involving our local communities and our local political leaders. And so we are planning to be working here to make change. And we hope that people in other localities can look around them, find people to uh, organize with, and do the same. Oh, thank you, Reverend Moore. Thank you so much. I just uh, really appreciate your taking the time, and and uh, we're looking forward to working with you going forward. So thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. God bless everyone and your beliefs. Thank you. And now, um, thank you. Uh, Robin Goka Huen will give everybody information about the breakout discussions. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you for that update, Susan. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to Reverend Moore for all of your powerful words. Um, we're so blessed in the San Jose area to have Reverend Moore, Richard Conda, Susan Hayase, and others as leaders. Um, so. We are now gonna transition um, to our small group discussions. It was such a powerful talk. I think everybody has um, the desire to meet a couple, a few other people and discuss a little bit about what we've heard. Um, we're going to go into breakout rooms, um, but before we do that, we want to um, talk a little bit about the guidelines uh, that we have emailed out to everybody and I'm gonna pass it to Akemi to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Reverend Moore. Um, so I'll be really brief because I think we want to have time, really spend our time in breakouts, just digesting what we've heard from Reverend Moore. 